Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to be here speaking with you. I'll go ahead and kick off the introductions. My name is Ryan Bermudez. I'm the Director of Customer Success at Signified. I lead both our European and Eastern United States regions within, uh, within Signified. So for my background, it's been fairly broad across retail. I worked both on the merchant side, working for Gap for a few years. And then more recently, I've been on the vendor side, working in various roles within e-commerce personalization, point of sale lending, and now in fraud at Signified. So I'll turn it over to Kimberly, my colleague and partner in crime to introduce herself. Hey everyone, my name is Kimberly So, and I'm excited for the opportunity to speak with the FraudCon community. I'm a senior customer success manager at Signified and I'm armed with 12 years in e-commerce experience with half of that working with retailers focused on prescriptive analytics and now fraud. Ryan and I are looking forward to sharing some of the insights and fraud trends that Signified has seen over the last few months, specifically in the e-commerce loan space. Uh, but before we dive in, wanted to give a brief overview of Signified. Signified is an end-to-end -end commerce protection platform used by over 10,000 merchants in over 100 countries worldwide. In 2019 alone, we screened $100 billion worth of transactions across those merchants. Signified's large network allows us to create a fuller picture of commerce, enabling our system to identify patterns in the data that an individual merchant might not see. What this means is that for 98% of orders that we receive, we've seen at least one or more predictive variables in a transaction somewhere else in our network. Signified's network has provided insights into different consumer behavior related to point of sale loan payments, which we'll call loan fraud. We'll soon explain how it's different from the typical card not present fraud that we're used to seeing and why a different lens is required to identify this type of fraud. But first, I'll hand it back to Ryan to talk about the market conditions that make this new type of fraud behavior possible in the first place. So I'll start by providing a bit of background on loans in retail and e-commerce. Um, loans unlock an entirely new customer segment. Possibly the original point of sale loan, if we all remember, was used in the cell phone industry. Not everybody had $500 to spend on the latest and greatest phone. So what the phone companies did was they allowed customers to get the phone up front for free and then make payments essentially over the 24 month life of the cell phone contract. These were effectively 0% loans that they were giving to their customers. And they were really a perfect option because they made those devices much more accessible to a larger number of customers. And that's exactly why loans are being used in e-commerce at an increasing rate today. So both traditional banks and lots of FinTech companies are involved in point of sale loans. Synchrony Bank, TD Bank, companies like Affirm and Klarna, they're now all offering buy now, pay later options. And point of sale loans offer a really compelling value prop. They deliver higher conversion rates for the merchants, higher average order values, and better customer loyalty. So across the board, it's, it's pretty easy to understand why these types of payment methods are gathering steam over the last few years. It's been a particularly hot topic given that point of sale uh, lender Affirm has recently filed to go public within the last month. And some analysts are, are valuing that company at over $10 billion at this point. Additionally, Motley Fool reported that over one third of US customers have used buy now pay later offerings in the US. And as a final point to underscore the prevalence in the point of sale lending space, Coherent Market Insights reported that in 2019, the market was $7.3 billion worldwide and is expected to grow to over $33 billion by 2027. So today, Kimberly is gonna be walking you through two examples of fraud in the loan space. And the main differences between traditional credit card and loan fraud 
is that fraudsters don't need access to your credit card details. They just have to steal your identity. And another difference in the loan fraud area is that the fraudsters have to pay attention to the victim's credit quality. They need to steal the credit of some or steal the identity of someone with a strong credit score. It's not particularly lucrative for them to go to the trouble of stealing someone's identity, apply for a loan, and then just get denied because of poor credit. So what are some good ways to increase the chances that the identity that you steal is with is from someone with good credit? So they can start with homeowners. Typically homeowners are going to have higher credit scores because they were able to secure a mortgage in the first place. And also if they target homes in more expensive areas, there's a better chance that the victims are gonna have a high credit score. Additionally, in this area of home selling, when people go to sell their homes, they open themselves up to theft in ways that they previously or normally wouldn't. So for instance, mailbox theft. Frequently they're receiving documents in the mail that have a lot more personal information in them. And so it's pretty easy for a fraudster to identify documents from a financial institution and just swipe that out of a mailbox. Additionally, homeowners literally open up their homes to complete strangers during open houses. So whereas a professional thief might tour a home to figure out what they wanna come back and steal later, an identity thief is there for another purpose altogether. They're there rifling through the seller's personal mail or home office, usually while their accomplice is keeping the real estate agent busy by asking questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to, Ken, uh, to Kimberly to jump into this trend that we identified. Great, thanks Ryan. So if we dive into this trend, um, you'll see that um, the billing addresses match the for sale homes on Zillow within Kalamazoo, Michigan. Highlighted on the screen, you'll see that those are the addresses matching those listings on Zillow.com. We also realize that this is a very localized attack within Kalamazoo, because not only are the billing addresses um, matching the for sale homes, but all of these orders are going to the same delivery address within Kalamazoo, Michigan. Lastly, another feature that I wanted to highlight from these orders was the skillful efforts of our fraudsters to make themselves look like the victims that they're targeting. So let's focus on one of these orders with Hank Owens. Hank Owens was born in the year 1966. Now, when you create an email address, we typically default to using our name, but when this is already taken, we attempt to apply any meaningful identifiers to make it our own. In this particular case, they appended 66 to the end of the name in the email. 66 equates to the birth year of Hank. This shows that the fraudsters are trying really hard to make themselves look like the people of the identities they're trying to steal, and they're actually quite good at it. Looking at each of these uh, features on their own may not seem that interesting and may not stand out, but when you look at the data altogether, it actually reveals quite a compelling fraud trend um, that's in the works. Thanks, Kimberly. So in our next example, we're going to be talking about how fraudsters take advantage of the retailer's policies to maximize the amount that they are able to steal. Again, a little bit of background here will probably be helpful on types of loans. So there are two types of loans in, in the point of sale lending space. One is closed ended, where the lender is going to create a loan for the exact amount of the purchase. And the, per the person, the customer, is going to agree to pay that amount back, plus interest, of course, over a period of time. So for example, let's say I'm checking out and my cart total is $507. The loan that I'm going to receive will be for exactly $507. Now, conversely, an open-ended loan, the customer is effectively approved for an open line of credit to use on that retailer's website. So once one of these loan accounts are established by the fraudster or compromised in an account takeover situation, 
they can pretty quickly be drawn down to zero. And so in this example, we're gonna be talking about an open-ended loan where the savvy fraudsters have been able to steal merchandise that was valued in excess of the credit line that was available to them. Now let's dive into the three orders that follow this trend. These are three orders that are using the same open-ended loan in order to um, get some highly coveted phones. The first thing that I want to point out about these three orders is the timing um, of the orders themselves. I feel like this is important to note because the fraudsters are attempting to avoid any velocity triggers by spacing out the orders accordingly. On the left is the first order placed on October 5th. On the, or in the middle, we see the second order placed nine days later on October 14th. And the third order on the right there is placed about one week later from that on October 22nd. Now, if we go back to the first order, you'll see that the customer attempted to purchase, purchase two iPhone 11 Pros, both with the max storage capacity and both unlocked versions because this is the easiest to resell. Along with a couple other items, the total for this order is just over $2,500. But along with other, like, or what's common with other merchants in the electronic space is offering a trade-in credit. This customer opted to trade in an iPhone X in order to receive a $300 instant credit on their order. Now, this fraudster has no intention of actually sending back the iPhone X, but it will be some time before the merchant realizes this. So the total for this order ends up being just over $2,200 after that credit is applied, and that's the amount deducted from the loan. We see here that the remaining account balance on the loan is about $1,970. So we can back into the original loan amount by using these amounts. If we add the $2,200 total plus the remaining um, account balance of $1,970, we see that the original account balance on the loan was $4,200. Now moving over to the second order, they purchased a Galaxy Note 10 Plus, again with the maximum storage and unlocked version, but this time they did not opt to apply a trade-in credit. This is important to note because the fraudsters calculated exactly which items they could purchase and when in order to maximize the value on the loan. So the total for this specific order is just under $1,300. This is then deducted from the previous account balance of $1,970, and we get a remaining account balance of $679. That brings us to the last order on the right. This is where they get the full bang for their buck. You see here that they purchased another iPhone 11 Pro, again, maximum storage and unlocked, this time, they did opt to apply a trade-in credit, but this time they applied the highest trade-in credit available, um, selecting an iPhone XS Max and receiving a $600 instant credit to their order. Again, the fraudster has no intention of sending back this iPhone XS Max, and it's important to note the timing of this because this trade-in was initiated just under two weeks from the initial one on October 5th. And the two weeks period is not uh, long enough um, to cause suspicion with the merchant that they didn't send back the iPhone X from the first trade-in. So after applying the $600 credit, this total is $651. This is then deducted from the uh, account balance of 679. And you'll see that the remaining account balance for this loan is now $28 essentially depleting the total value of the loan. Now, if we do the math, you'll see that this fraudster essentially um, received 
$5,100 of goods stolen with a $4,200 loan. To wrap up, I just wanted to share some numbers from one of our customers over the last year. Signified helped prevent $60 million in loan fraud, identified across 14 unique trends, including two of the trends that we just described. As you can tell, loan fraud is hard to detect just by the traditional credit card indicators. So if you are thinking of offering loans or are already offering loans and are not covered by your lender, it's important to consider how you'll be analyzing those um, factors beyond the traditional credit card fraud indicators. And it's necessary to take a wider scope of this data. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, so hopefully everyone found some interesting pieces of information about loan fraud in the two examples that we walked through today. And one final takeaway that we wanted to leave you with is an ebook that Signified recently published on customer abuse. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we've really seen a massive uptick in friendly fraud and customer abuse occurring uh, within our network. And that ebook outlines some of the reasons for this consumer abuse and how you as a merchant can protect yourself from it. Also, if any of you are interested in discussing these trends or have any other questions for us, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. We've included our email addresses here. Personally, I think these new tactics that fraudsters are developing are really fascinating and I love to talk about them. So please reach out if you're, you're interested. So thanks for spending uh, part of your day with us. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of the day.